Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Welcome to our All Around the Altar service this morning. And uh, this morning service is where we come together and uh, learn with each other, with God at the centre. And today our service theme is, um, who is Jesus to us? And more personally, who is Jesus to you? Um, Jenny will be sharing her thoughts uh, on our Bible passage and uh, exploring this theme with us a little bit later on. And I'm hoping that some of you have been able to respond to the call, um, either via email or via our notice sheet, of just sharing who Jesus is to you. And as I said, Jenny will be sharing some of those thoughts and explorations with us a little bit later on. So as we gather together now, we're going to uh, start our service by inviting uh, the Lord Jesus to be with us by the lighting of our candles and the Jones family is kindly going to do that for us. Light the light in, in the name, name of the anchor. Now light a light in the name of the Son, who saved the world and stretched out his hand to me. I will light a light in the name of the Spirit, who is present everywhere in the world and gives me strength. We will light three lights for the Trinity of Love, God above us, God beside us, God beneath us, the beginning, the end and the everlasting one. So as we gather together this morning, let us join in our first song, We Want to See Jesus Lifted High. And this will then lead straight into our Bible reading, which is brought to us this morning by Alex Jordan. And then Jenny will lead on sharing the thoughts um, that she has to share with us um, about this Bible text and about who is Jesus to us. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little we're taking ground. Every prayer of powerful weapon, strongholds come, tumbling down. Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across the land. Let all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across the land. Let all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We're gonna see, we're gonna see. We're gonna see Jesus lifted high. We're gonna see, we're gonna see, we're gonna see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little we're taking ground. Every prayer of powerful weapon, strongholds come, tumbling down and down and down and down. We want to 
The reading is taken from Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20. Now Christ is a visible expression of the invisible God. He existed before creation began, for it was through him that everything was made, whether spiritual or material, seen or unseen. Through him and for him also are created power and dominion, ownership and authority. In fact, every single thing was created through and for him. He is both the first principle and the upholding principle of the whole scheme of creation. And now he is the head of the body, which is composed of all Christian people. Life from nothing began through him, and life from the dead began through him, and he is therefore justly called the Lord of all. It was in him that the full nature of God chose to live, and through him God planned to reconcile in his own person, as it were, everything on earth and everything in heaven by virtue of the sacrifice of the cross. Well, thank you, Alex, for that reading. That passage paints a wonderful picture of Jesus and I'll take a closer look at that passage shortly. But this morning we're going to look at two slightly different questions. We're going to look at who is Jesus? And that's kind of head knowledge. We know, need to know who Jesus is if we are, are to follow him. And we need to know what the Bible says about Jesus. And the more we know about him, the more incredible we find he is. And this passage is quite incredible. But also we're asking, who is Jesus to you? And that's a heart question. So we thought we'd ask you for some answers to that question, who is Jesus to you? And I was blown away by your answers. So I'm going to share some of those with you now. First, as a powerful testimony of what difference Jesus makes in so many people's lives today. So, here we go. Who is Jesus? So, some responses we had. Jesus is a constant in my life, always there every day, sometimes closer than others, but always with me. Jesus has brought an extraordinary peace in these difficult times, and then Jesus is my brother in arms. He shields me in battle and never leaves my side. Isn't that wonderful? Let's see another one. Jesus is my assurance of eternal life. And this is from a young person. Jesus is the living water. And from another young person. Jesus is the son of God. And how about this one? Jesus is my saviour, my lord and my friend. Jesus is the one I turn to in times of sorrow or joy. He is a friend that will never give up on me, no matter how much I mess up. Jesus is the greatest teacher of all times, and he's my one true love. We have just a few more. Jesus is my saviour and the keeper of my life. Jesus is my creator, saviour, and my sacrifice for sin, brother, friend, my Lord and my God. Jesus is my friend and my God, always there, always listens. And finally for now, Jesus is someone I can always talk to. Oops, one more. Jesus is our great influencer and guide for my life. So that is how some people see Jesus for them. Who is Jesus to you? But now we're going to just have a look at that passage and see who is Jesus. Um, and I'm sure you've heard the Sunday school um, story of the, a teach, Sunday school teacher who asked the question of her class, OK, boys and girls, what's brown, eats nuts and lives in trees? And the class goes completely silent. Uh, I'm rather stumped. And then a, 
a boy puts up his hand and says, Miss, I know the answer is Jesus, but it does sound awfully like a squirrel. Hmm. Well, today I'm going to look at some really big questions. And actually, the answer to all of these really big questions is Jesus. Oops, I've already told you the answers, but let's see what you think. This passage shows us that Jesus is the one who is the answer to all of life's biggest questions, all of the most profound questions in life. And knowing that can give a real richness to our heart knowledge of him. And he can make our hearts grow bigger. So today I'm going to show you, or try and show you, how Jesus is the answer to no less than six big life questions. All from this marvellous passage Alex has just read to us from the book of Colossians. This letter was written by Paul to encourage the churches, to encourage them to live faithfully because of how amazing Jesus is. So, let's think of our big questions. Here's the first one. What does God look like? What do you think? Could you draw a picture of God? Would your God look anything like this? Well, if we read our passage from Colossians, verse 15 tells us, when we look at the sun and see, we, we see God who cannot be seen, or the NIV version says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. But what does that mean? One of Jesus' disciples, Philip, once said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus replied to him, Don't you know me, Philip, after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. But what does it mean to see the Father? What does it mean that Jesus is the image of God? If I showed you a photo of my, my children, it would be an image of them, yeah? And perhaps there are some family resemblances, maybe. But just because you saw a picture of my children, you wouldn't know what I looked like, never mind what I'm like as a person. God is not just Jesus' dad sitting up in heaven. No, it means something much more. God is much bigger than that. So what does it mean? If we see Jesus, we see God. Does Jesus help us to see what God is like? His character? Well, there's definitely something in that. But let's take a look at some of the other big questions before we come back to that one and decide. So here's the second big question. Where does the world come from? Now you know the answer to all these questions. Yes, the answer is, of course, Jesus. Verse 16 says, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank of angels, everything got started by him. So it's Jesus. The NIV says, all things were created by Jesus. So just think about that for a moment. It's telling us that Jesus created the entire universe. You see, Jesus didn't come into existence in a stable in Bethlehem in the year zero, or whenever historians think it was. Jesus was around before the world was created. He existed before time began, which means he's eternal, just like God the Father. Before the world was created, indeed before anything had been created, before there was anything, there was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, a perfect loving community existing outside of time because they hadn't decided to invent time by then. 
long before Jesus was born as a human being, he was there very much involved in creation. And that's why John's Gospel, which we read at Christmas, says, through him, through Jesus, all things were made, but without him, nothing that was made has been made. So when we talk about the birth of Jesus, it's vital to remember that Jesus did not begin to exist when Mary fell pregnant. Instead, he'd been the master and owner of the universe since he helped make it. Tricky stuff, but it's important. You see, at Christmas, we weren't celebrating the birth of the founda foundation of Christianity. We were celebrating the birth of the founder of the universe. All oh, we're doing big questions today. So let's go on to our third big questions. Why? Why does the universe exist? Any answers? Any guesses for the answer? And yes, the, the answer is, of course, Jesus. The universe exists for Jesus. And we know that because that's tucked away right at the end of verse 16. And it's easy to miss. The NIV says that all things were created by him and for him. And when Alex read the version from the message, it said that everything finds its purpose in him. So why was the universe made? It was made for Jesus. Why was the earth made? It was made for Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate meaning of creation which also means he's the ultimate meaning of our lives. For all creation was made for Jesus. And so it stands to reason that we too were made for Jesus. If everything in creation finds purpose in Jesus, then how can we ever claim to know the purpose for our lives if we don't know Jesus for ourselves? For he is the ultimate purpose for all, us all. Let's look at the fourth big question. You're doing well there. Why does science work? The answer is because of Jesus. That's right. Jesus was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. Jesus holds creation together. The fabric of the universe, the stuff of our bodies, our houses, the ground on which we stand, is all held together by Jesus. It's all sustained and kept going by Jesus. If Jesus wasn't doing that, the universe was disintegrated, it would cease to exist. Now, all you budding scientists may be thinking, but surely it's the laws of physics that hold the universe together. And I'd have to say, yes, you're absolutely right. But scientists didn't invent the laws of physics. They just worked them out. They worked out how Jesus created the world. The laws of physics hold constant because Jesus holds them constant. That's what in him all things hold together means. And because he holds them constant, we live in a predictable, measurable, observable universe. I don't know about you, but I know architects who have worked out how to make extraordinary buildings and hold them together. I've heard of great generals leading and keeping their armies together. I've heard of great politicians, political leaders who managed to hold whole countries together. But who has ever heard of a man who can hold an entire universe together? That's Jesus. He's bigger than we could ever imagine. Okay, question five. Why does the church exist? And the answer, of course, is because of Jesus. 
He organises the church and holds it together, like a head does a body. And the NIB says, he is the head of the body, the church. We often talk about my church or your church, don't we? Or we talk about St John's church or Pip and Jim's or whatever. But actually, every church is Jesus's church. Every church should be called Christ's church. Because the church of is God's family here on earth, and the church belongs to Jesus. Not Andrea, sorry Andrea, not the bishops or the archbishops, not even the Pope. Only Jesus is head over the church. It is his spiritual body, his spiritual family. We belong to one worldwide family. We have brothers and sisters across the world because Jesus is the head of the whole church. And that's why the church exists. Whew. Let's pause just a moment and just do a recap on what the passage is telling us. So, what does God look like? He looks like Jesus. Where does the world come from? It comes from Jesus. Why does the world exist? The universe exists. It exists for Jesus. Why does science works? work because of Jesus? Why does church exist? Because of Jesus. So when our passage calls Jesus the image of the invisible God, he is clearly way, way more than just a picture. But how much more? Before we go on to our final big question, let's just come back to our original question for a moment. Who is Jesus? In verse 19, it kind of answers that question. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, dwell in Jesus. And let's just think about that statement for a moment. Okay, so this cup of water represents God. Uh, the water, if you like, is the fullness of God. It's what he is. And God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. So now, the fullness of God is in Jesus. What's he saying? That all of God's fullness dwells in Jesus. Or, to call a spade a spade, Jesus is God. Cast your mind back to Easter. Every Easter we, we tend to read the chapters in John's Gospel that covers the resurrection especially chapter 20, and at the end of it, you get all that business of doubting Thomas, and when Thomas finally realises Jesus has written from the grave, what does he say? He says, my Lord and my God. In other words, he calls Jesus God, and he says it to his face. And what does Jesus say? Does he say, hold on a minute, you missed the point. No, he accepts the praise because he is God. When Jesus came to earth as a man, it says in Philippians chapter 2, he had equal status with God but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling on to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He was still God, but humbled himself, even allowing himself to die for us. Time for one last big question. Who defines good and evil? Who defines what is right and what is wrong? It's not the BBC, it's not Facebook, it's not Instagram. 
No, you've got it, it is. Jesus, the creator of the universe has spoken plainly to us in his word, in the Bible. Jesus speaks about good and evil, about right and wrong, about how we should live. He speaks about how we should live every aspect, every area of our lives. And deep down, we know we have not lived up to those standards. And that creates a barrier between us and God that spoils our relationship with him and with one another. And that makes what our passage talks about, last of all, even more remarkable. The passage says, all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things and animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death his blood that poured down from the cross. The NIV puts it this way, he reconciled to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He will make all things well. He is indeed our saviour. And people say, don't they, how can the death of one man do all that? How can the death of one man reconcile our broken, bruised, reckon, rebellious world to God? Well, the answer is that he can only accomplish it, accomplish it because Jesus was far more than just a man. Jesus was a man, but he was also fully God. He allowed himself to be crucified because he loves us. He loves you. He wants each and every one of us to know that love so we can know the Father for ourselves, so that we can be forgiven for not living up to God's love. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Jesus is the answer. So by knowing all this head knowledge, by knowing Jesus is God, and knowing he creates and sustains the whole universe and he sustains us, it makes us even more incredible that we can know Jesus in our hearts. We can know him personally and intimately. And we're able to say, as Rami wrote, Jesus is my saviour, my Lord and my friend. Jesus is the one I turn to in times of sorrow. He is the friend that will never give up on me, no matter how much I mess up. Jesus is the greatest teacher of all time, and he is my one true love. Who is Jesus to you? We're going to spend some time reflecting on God's message to each one of us this morning by singing or listening to the song When the Music Fades.
Thank you, Jenny, for sharing those thoughts to us and some really interesting concepts there, which we can actually reflect on uh, as we uh, continue uh, through our week with Jesus by our side and who he means to us. Now, our prayers this morning um, are a collection of uh, prayers. Now, some of you might have been responding to Archbishop Justin Welby's respond for the nation to come to prayer uh, within the past week. And as a diocese, we have also been contributing to those prayers. So the prayers this morning that we're going to uh, join in with each other and gather together and pray um, are a collection of some of those prayers that were recorded previously this week on the particular days so that we can come together as a congregation, as a parish, as a community and as a nation and respond to coming together and that call to pray. So let us pray with one another. And then at the end, we'll join these prayers together by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. We are being invited through this month of February to join together in prayer. We've been invited by our archbishops and other church leaders nationally to pray for our nation as we did at a time last year as well. But as we pray in this continuing situation of the pandemic, with both the... Um, the hopes and possibilities of vaccines and so forth, but also the continuing uh, sadnesses and the suffering and the anxieties, not least in the light of the, the new variants and so forth. And on Fridays, we're being encouraged to pray for national and local government. And while we may immediately think of national government and government ministers giving press conferences and that sort of stuff and um, praying for them, and of course we must, I want to encourage us also to think about those who are our councillors in um, county and district councils, parish councillors in our local communities, all who occupy positions of responsibility in our communities, who are seeking, I think all of them really, to do the best for the people uh, who they are seeking to serve in the places where they are. And as there are so many challenges, pressures on funding, pressures on resources, all those things at all levels. So we pray for those in national and local government. We pray for those who are in positions of authority with responsibility for decision making at national and local level through this difficult time. We ask that God would give great wisdom, deep commitment to all, and right judgment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Welcome as we join in prayer for the nation. Today we pray for those who are elderly, isolated and vulnerable. Please join me in bringing before God the needs of all who are struggling today. Those feeling alone and cut off from family and friends, or worrying about their health and when they will receive the vaccine. All who live in our care homes, as well as those feeling imprisoned in their own homes. We echo God's commitment to those most at risk from this virus. By praying today for those who are particularly vulnerable and isolated, praying for their deliverance, protection and comfort. We hold before God those who care for them, that they would be strengthened in their work. We remember health and care workers and family carers whose reserves of hope and energy are spent who are on the edge of coping with the demands of each day. Uphold and sustain them, O Lord, in your everlasting arms. Amen. Today will you join me as we pray for those who work in the NHS and other key workers 
Healthcare chaplains are acutely aware of how so many in the NHS are tired, are challenged by the level of need they find in their work, and many are deeply touched by the lives and indeed the deaths of the individuals they care for. And so we pray. Our God is the great healer and the agent used more than any other in the NHS. Today we voice, Lord, our gratitude for those who serve this country in the National Health Service and pray, Lord, that you would prosper the work of their hands and that you would sustain them, encourage them and strengthen them in their continued work of sacrifice and of care. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to our prayer this evening as we respond to pray for our nation. Please do join me as we gather together to pray for our families, our friends and loved ones. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you now in faith, hope and reassurance that when we gather, you are in the midst of us. We bring before you those now in our communities who are friends, families and loved ones. As we picture them in our minds and thoughts now, we ask for your presence and healing power to be present in their lives, to heal bodies that are weak or sick, to restore well-being, and for them to seek you at this time when fear and uncertainty can creep in. Show us, Father, how we can support and come alongside those who are close to us that your love and power will be revealed to them through our actions as we minister alongside them in your name. Bring healing to broken relationships and we pray for reconciliation to occur. Father, you have called us to be in fellowship with one another, to be united in you. This, Father, is our prayer for our families, friends and loved ones. Amen. So let us combine those prayers together and those thoughts together of our own by saying the Lord's Prayer with each other. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So I'd like to draw now um, your attention to the notice sheet. Please take a look at your notice sheet. Uh, hopefully you've been sent this either by email or by post. And I'm sure there's certain things on there for us to pray for. There's things that you'll be interested in. Um, and there's things that you'll want to take note of. So please take a look at the notice sheet for this week. Good morning, everybody. Well, I just wanted to draw out one notice from our newsletter this week, and that's about Ash Wednesday. So as we begin the season of Lent together, uh, we're going to be holding a, a service on Ash Wednesday, 17th of February at half past seven in the evening. And that will be an online service. We're not meeting in the building, but uh, our service will be uh, online via our church Facebook page. Um, and uh, we will be uh, having a service of com Holy Communion and the imposition of ashes. I would like to give you the opportunity to be able to ash yourself at home uh, and maybe with your household members. So if you'd like to receive some ash, um, if you could let me know, my details are in the newsletter, 
uh, preferably by Wednesday, but the very latest on Thursday, so that we can make sure that we get uh, that ash to you on time. Uh, also, we will make uh, available the service order and the sermon uh, to those of you who usually receive things by post, and if you receive our communications by email, then that will come to you by email as usual. So I do hope that you'll be able to join with us uh, in some way as we uh, begin the season of Lent together with our Ash Wednesday service. Thank you. So for those of you who celebrate a birthday in uh, February, we want to wish you a very happy birthday. And although that we can't be get together to sing to you, we certainly all wish you a very happy and blessed birthday as you celebrate in the month of February. So from all of us to you, happy birthday. As we are starting to draw our service to a close this morning, let's share with each other the grace that the Lord Jesus Christ has given to us including our actions. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Our final song this morning is for us to be able to respond to Jesus Christ that he does indeed open the eyes of our hearts, that we can gather with him, that we can come and be with him and respond to who he is in our lives. So let's join together in the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord.
So we're now going to say our words to close our service until we gather together again. From where you lead us to where you need us, Jesus, now lead on. From the security of what we know to the adventure of what you reveal, Jesus, now lead on. To make this world look more like your kingdom, Jesus, now lead on. Amen. So I hope that you continue to stay uh, healthy and to stay well and to continue to be blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So until we gather again in worship. Amen. Oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I'll worship your holy Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name.